Alright, time for another draft physics video presentation. I should have cleaned this off. Yeah, my bad. Alright, close enough. Um, anyway, <coughs> sorry. So I just make a clarification. I'm going to do a Sabine Hassenfelder, close enough maybe, uh, video response because it's on Heisenberg and, you know, there's just such a catch to Heisenberg. There's no real Heisenberg anything that's reasonable. I mean, um, this idea that the particle is somehow confused and it's not our vision, that's no good. We can't see it. Not that it's in some can't tell where it is kind of position. I mean, it's it's just such a silly interpretation of something so obvious, you know, that our vision is, gets blurry. If I move this really fast, you can't really see where it is, can you? No. Um, it's just really bad. Uh, just a frame rate argument in a sense. But anyway, um, so I just want to make a clarification on Stern Gerlach um, in the last video. Um, because the thing you always have to understand about an ion is... Um, so, so ions are being shot with the experiment. Okay, you shoot ions through this little funky magnet. Okay, a little funky magnet system. And um, the ions go through and they end up making a pattern. It's kind of teardroppy, you know. So some of the stuff goes right through the middle. Some goes up, some goes down. Um, and they keep saying that this is somehow an electron experiment. It has nothing to do with electrons. They're atoms. So, they're, and they're, so, so the normal atom is a balanced atom, generally speaking. It has just as much positive charge as it has negative charge. Which, in a sense, if you want to make it a magnet, that means you have a magnet that has just as much south as it has north. Which is, you can't make a magnet any other way, technically, right? When it comes to a magnet, you can't have more north magnet than south magnet because that's the nature of magnets. I won't go into why that is, but anyway. But atoms can create an imbalanced magnet. That is, you can create an atom, okay, that's essentially a disproportional atom. Okay, it has more north end than it has south end, um, and vice versa, of course. So you can create these ions. Okay, positive and negative ions, which means there's either too many electrons or too few electrons, which means there's more proton or more electron, which means essentially that there's more, <coughs> um, uh, the, la the magnet is lopsided. So then if you had a lopsided magnet, that is if you could make a compass needle, okay, that was lopsided, okay, the north needle was bigger than the south needle, which you can't do, but if we could, you would, could imagine that if I arranged it around a magnet, it would give you very wrong results. It would turn in all kinds of stupid ways. And the same is true for these things. So when you shoot them through this thing, they can be, they can have a little south end and a big north end. You know, they can have a, I should have drawn that better. You know, the idea would be is, I'm going to exaggerate it, but they can have this huge difference in their proportions of uh, which way they're facing, okay? Um, so this could be, you just say this is the plus end. So they could go into the experiment this way or this way. And they're not going to do what a traditional magnet is. is they're not going to turn and do all that stuff because turning requires an equality in the force. And there won't be an equality anymore. And then you, obviously you could also send the magnet in this way or this way. And <clears throat> you'll get different results. And the truth is, some of this will be forced on the ions. The ions will be forced to move. They will do some moving. It's just that it won't be the kind of even movement you have with a traditional magnet. So the idea is, is the ones that go in facing down are going to end up being pushed down. The ones that are facing up are going to end up being pushed up. And the ones that go in, not decidingly any one of those two, uh, will end up in the middle. Um, Another way of looking at it, these ones in the middle are actually actual silver atoms that never got disbalanced. That is, they're not unbalanced magnets. They're regular um, atoms, which means they have plus in the middle and negative on the outside. And they're not going to turn or do anything. They're just going to go straight through. So you could say these are non-ions. The Oh, yeah, this is, you can almost see that. So these are not ions. The ones that go through the middle are not ions. The ones that go up are ions pointed the wrong, you know, positive ions. The ones that go down are negative ions.
happens. And that's a simple explanation for the results. Now, they say this has something to do with proving electron spin, all kinds of other nonsense. They're atoms. There's, there's no electrons going through this experiment. There's no single protons going through the experiment. There's just ions. So why are they talking about an electron spin when the experiment is just showing you which way imbalanced magnets go through the experiment? I'm sending little magnets through. So anyway, just clarifying. All right, on to the show and such. Heisenberg. Hi, everybody. I have decided that this channel lacks a history part because there is so much that we can learn from the history of science. So, so yeah, the most important part is going through, yeah, you even go through Faraday's speculations and how he was wrong and what kind of mistakes he might have made would be a good thing to do, Newton's little angel theories and other nonsense. Yeah, it'd be good if, if any of you could tell the history accurately, but frankly, you can't. Uh, you'll talk about Young experiment as if it showed something new when it was just Newton's rings all over again. No surprise, no mysteries resolved, nothing explained. You had the same situation. What are two inside slits doing versus what are two outside surfaces doing? Just Newton's experiments all over again. Today I want to tell you a story. It's the story of how Werner Heisenberg got the uncertainty principle named after him. Heisenberg was born in 1901 in the German city of Würzburg. He went on to study physics in Munich. In 1923, Heisenberg was scheduled for his final oral examination to obtain his doctorate. He passed mathematics, theoretical physics and astronomy just fine. But then he ran into trouble with experimental physics. Uh, right, so there's, it's just this to part of the physics. It's probably like part of the doctor's exam is you know knowing how far your reflexes bounce when you hit somebody in the knee or some other kind of crap that isn't very uh, important data. So anyway, so yes, uh, in the past they you know, it's like you know ice skating sort of you know they changed the standards for ice skaters. They used to have to do figure eights and be very precise and do all of these things and little tricks. And then they just got rid of all that stuff and just said, no, all you got to do is a good show. If you put on a good show, you win. It doesn't have to have all this technical crap in it. His examination in experimental physics was by Wilhelm Wien. That's the guy who has Wien's law named after him. Yeah, Wien, as an experimentalist, had required that Heisenberg did a practicum, which is a series of exercises in physics experimentation. It's lab work for beginners, basically. But the university lacked some equipment and Heisenberg was not interested enough to find out where to get it. So he just moved on to other things without looking much into the experiments that he was supposed to do. That, as it turned out, was not a good idea. When Heisenberg... Okay, we could probably do without all this preliminary stuff, but uh, sorry, tough luck. The next day of the experimental examination came, it did not go well. In their book, The Historical Development of Quantum Theory, Mera and Rechenberg recount, Wien was annoyed when he learned in the examination that Heisenberg had done so little in the experimental exercise given to him. He then began to ask Heisenberg questions to gauge his familiarity with the experimental setup. For instance, he wanted to know what the resolving power of the fabry perot interferometer was. Wien had explained all this in one of his lectures on optics. Besides, Heisenberg was supposed to study it anyway. I don't know why all this extra text is put on there, but whatever. Uh, you know, she speaks good enough English. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so what's to say about this? Yeah, so, so this is kind of just pointing out the division line between theoretical physics and, you know, experimental physics and the fact that... Uh, there was this problem. I mean, you, what did a doctorate in physics mean? Did it mean that you knew how to do experiments and you knew how to interpret the data of experiments? Or were you one of these little wooey religious leaders who decided to do, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, voodoo? <laughs> you know, voodoo physics. Anyway, but he had not done so and now tried to figure it out unsuccessfully in the short time available during the examination. Wien asked about the resolving power of a microscope. Heisenberg did not know that either. Wien questioned him about the resolving power of telescopes, which Heisenberg also did not know. What happened next? 
Well, Wien wanted to fail Heisenberg, but the theoretical physicist Arnold Sommerfeld came to Heisenberg's help. Heisenberg had excelled in the axiom on theoretical physics, and so Sommerfeld put in a strong word in favor of giving Heisenberg his PhD. With that, Heisenberg passed the doctoral examination, though he got the lowest possible grade. But this was not the end of the story. Heisenberg was so embarrassed about his miserable performance that he sat down to learn everything about telescopes and microscopes that he could find. Yeah, so that's the, the part of the story. So she just started right there to say that he was sort of embarrassed in an examination because he didn't know the answers to some of these elementary physics questions. And um, so he decided to up his knowledge. This was in the early days of quantum mechanics, and it led him to wonder if there is a fundamental limit to how well one can resolve structures with a microscope. Well, it seems a duh kind of thing. Of course you know there's a limit, because you know photons have a limited amount of, you know, smallness. Um, and even through polarization you can draw this conclusion. The polarization is essentially telling you the resolving limit because the photon won't be a photon if the thing is smaller than the polarization of the light. The thing can't reflect a photon if the object is smaller than the polarization of the light. He went about formulating a thought experiment which is now known as Heisenberg's microscope. This thought experiment was about measuring a single electron, something which was actually not possible at the time. Right, and the theory would go something like this. <clears throat> the resolving power of a photon is its polarization. So if you use an infrared light, you got that. If you use ultraviolet light, you have that. Right, and if you use a gamma ray or an x-ray, you have something even finer. So this is a size. And this size for like an ultra, uh, I mean an infrared photon, this size might be 2,000 atoms of dimension. Um, you know, and this might, now you're down to maybe 5,000 here, and then you might be down to 25 here. Um, so you're getting better and better and better at resolving, you know, having some hope of reflecting off of a surface. And so the idea is, is that you'd have to substantially get lucky and have a photon hit an object, have photons hit the object. So the object is here. You have a bunch of photons going in at all these different polarizations, if you can understand that. I mean, each one is, they're semi-parallel to each other, but they all have a different square size I could draw here. So in this area, if you send in enough photons, thousands of them, millions of them, you could understand that a lot of them are overlapping in the area that they're hitting, and that what you're going to count on is that the overlapping photons will be able to reflect off this small object here, this one atom. Um, and that so you're really hoping that it, out of these millions, you'll have the right pieces from certain ones will be all in this line and that that photon will be able to reflect back to you and it'll have a very fine polarization. The one coming back to you is going to be essentially have a much narrower polarization to obviously be, and it's just a reconstruction of a bunch of photons. So no, no single photon bounces back. It's really a composite. You're taking pieces from different ones of these photons and the pieces that are all on this line and those are the pieces you're going to get, have some hope of getting back. So that's essentially defining the resolving power is the amount of light first you can expose it to. See, that's one of the, f the problems with a microscope is lighting the subject you're trying to see. You can't even get light to it sometimes in any co in a coherent way. Um, and a lot of things you end up looking at them based on their shadow they project um, because you really can't get the light to ever hit the matter bits um, in some way that you can recombine photons and view the object. So it's a real limitation of microscopes is just lighting the subject. Um, right, so I don't know if I need to say any more. So this is one of the complexifications of resolving powers. How many, how many quanta, how many bits, how many, 
you know, if you were thinking it of waves, this is the way the waves are all piled on top of each other. Okay, the photons are all traveling in the same space, so to speak. And you know, what you're counting on is these nodes being in the right place and you know, this photon and this photon. So this little this this photon supplies the first bit. This photon supplies the second quanta. This photon supplies the third. So you're spreading you're combining different photons to create photons that are all traveling this line, quanta, that's all traveling a narrow enough line for you to get a reflection off a small object. But yes, seeing an electron, no chance. <clears throat> seeing an atom, no real chance. The smallest distance you can resolve with the microscope that is called the delta x depends on both the wavelength of the light that you use, which I will call lambda, and the opening angle of the microscope. So again, the wavelength is proportional to the polarization. So it has nothing to do with the wavelength of the light. It has to do with the polarization of the light. The polarization goes up with the wavelength. Radio waves, big giant polarization. Uh, you know, different kinds of light, narrower and narrower wave streams if you want to ray width the thickness of the th the ray is thinner and thinner the higher the frequency and that's the correlation it's the thickness of the of the photon again i argue the photon is just quanta it's just little clumps but regardless of how you interpret it this equation is using the wrong variable the variable that matters is the polarization and yes the polarization is proportional to the wavelength but it isn't the wavelength I mean it works but I'm just saying it is wrong they have the wrong variable in there they have one that works because it's proportional but it is wrong Cope epsilon the smallest resolvable distance is proportional to the wavelength so a smaller wavelength allows you to resolve smaller structures. Because it has a narrower polarization. And it is inversely proportional to the sine of the opening angle. So this sine of the opening angle is just the whole or thing that you're going to try to look at. So it's really not an opening angle. I mean, she's talking about the resolving power of the microscope based on the diffraction that takes place on the edges of the you know the light that's bending um but the real factor is is you have to have an opening that's number one big enough for the photon to get back through <laughs> so uh, yes smaller opening angle makes the resolution worse but said heisenberg if light is made of particles that's the photons and i try to measure the position of an electron with light then the photons will kick the electron Right, so this is just a simple principle that the concept of what a photon is doing is it's a thing moving the speed of light and it imposes momentum on electrons. That's how we detect a photon. I mean, we already, everybody knows this. I mean, this isn't a secret. Photon, okay, hits electron. Electron moves, okay, proportional to what hit it. All right, and that's how, what, that's how what we detect. We detect electrons moving we can't see photons we can only see electrons moving because they create a little bit of electricity yeah that's almost on the board so that's how we detect a photon is we can't we gain electricity from the fact that the, the electron moves in the material the movement of the electron creates us uh, an electric current the electric current is what we detect and so we say a photon hit that's how a photo detector works and all that kind of crap um, but the, the catch to all this is, like, I, like I've stated, the, the polarization of the photon is absolutely huge. That is, the pieces of the quanta are hugely displaced. The electron is so small I can't even draw it here, okay? So how can this giant thing, okay, this giant polarization hit this tiny object? I mean, we can all kind of figure out that's highly unlikely that the entire photon would just plow right into this so it's going to obviously miss it so it's obviously always pieces more than one electron 
has to be involved in the process of making a new photon. Um, so it's a combined effort kind of argument, and that's why you could argue that metals are crystals, that's why metals are allowed to create current, because the crystal in the metal is a matrix of electrons, and so all you need to do is hit this electron and this electron, and both those signals will be combined into one action by the crystal. The crystal reacts by adding up everything that hits the crystal. So the crystal ends up being one object. And what you're really doing is stimulating the whole object, and the whole object is sending a signal that you're receiving as a photon. All right, but anyway, that's neither, that's a step beyond this subject. So, yeah, you know, I think I've just made the point that this is about the polarization of the light. And now we're gonna to get to the momentum part. So now the momentum part to understand is, is that the electron, we also know that electrons are bound in tension. And that tension can be this way, right? Or the tension could actually be in this direction, okay, in the atom. Or the tension could be in this direction, in the atom. And so when you hit it with energy this way, the electron, because it's in tension, can move this way. Or it could move this way. Or it could move this way. And that's a problem, because now if it goes in these other directions, we're going to just measure how much distance it moved, right? And so you can see this is a lot less diff different distance if it goes this way or this way. We're not going to be able to, we're saying that's not a complete action. So this is the complete action. It's getting here. That means the momentum completely went into it and we can detect it because it went here. If it, if it bends, then we have two factors. We have how much did it move this way and how much did it move this way. And this is what becomes the Heisenberg principle in the sense that what, we're, what they're saying is unless the photon completely gives us all its information in one direction, we can't say how much of this there is and how much of this there is. So if it goes at some other angle, we can't just decipher okay which way it went um, and so we have an uncertainty you know whether it went this way or whether it went that way we can't tell that's an uncertainty in its direction and um, so that's what this is really all about it's just the fact that if the momentum travels in some direction that's not the direction we can detect we're very uncertain about which way it could have gone, whether it's this way or that way. We can't tell those two apart, essentially. We have no technology that will give us that answer, so they call it an uncertainty. But it's not a real uncertainty. So this whole thing's going to come down to is there's three dimensions, as has been pointed out. And the trick is, is two of the dimensions are always on the same plane. So if the, if the photon's moving this way, which means its momentum is going this way, and the electron is maybe going to convert that into these other two dimensions. That's the trick. It's going to convert it into two other dimensions. It can go up and down. It can go left and right. And so that's where our uncertainty lies. And so if we know it went a certain amount right, okay, that can give us a reason to believe it had to go the rest of the way left. Okay, so, you know, once you know... Once you know how much it has in one direction, you can figure out how much it has in the other direction. Now, they invert this into a, uh, an uncertainty, which isn't a real thing. I mean, there's no, there's no amount of uncertainty. There's an amount of certainty. So if you had 100% certainty that it went this way because you measured it, well, then you know this uncertainty is zero. <laughs> right? So it's just a, a backward way of saying, if you know one piece of information, how much can you know about the other piece? Uh, well, we'll let her say it, and then we'll try to re-say it in a better way. But it just has to do with the fact that the electron doesn't necessarily move in the same direction as the photon's momentum. And because of that, we can't tell whether it went this way, that way, this way, or that way, because all of those will have the same result that we measure. We just measure it as less energy. And we know the less energy is because it took a crooked path. But I need some opening angle for the microscope to work, which means I don't know exactly where the photon is coming from. 
Therefore, the act of measuring the position of the electron with a photon actually makes me less certain about where the electron is because I didn't know where the photon came from. Well, that's half your problem, but again, the, the real problem is, is that the electron is not going to tell you reliably the momentum of the photon because the electron isn't going to move straight. Heisenberg estimated that the momentum that would be transferred from the photon to the electron is proportional to the energy of the photon, which means it is inversely proportional to the wavelength. And so, again, it's this inversely proportional to wavelength thing is a real problem because that's not a real that's not real energy that's just the energy of proximity so it really doesn't have anything it's it's not in my opinion a sensible way to understand it clearly all the momentum of the photon will be uh, will have an interaction with the electron the photon will the, the quantum of energy will be reflected and the electron will gain momentum that's going to happen. There's going to be a transfer of direction. And it is proportional to the sine of the opening angle. So if we call that momentum delta p, we have delta p is proportional to sine epsilon over lambda. And the constant in front of this is Planck's constant, because that gives you the relation between the energy and the wavelength of the photon. Says them, um, the relationship is clear. Uh, it's momentum. The photon has a certain amount of weight, mass, and that's really what the H is now going to represent as the mass of, you know, the mass and the velocity of the photon. It's the quanta of the photon. Now you can see that if you multiply the two uncertainties, the one in position and the one in momentum of the electron, you find that it's just Planck's constant. This is Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. The more you know about the position of the particle, the less you know about the momentum and the other way around. Right. Well, it's just, obviously, it's just saying the, the, the simple argument is, is the position is going to be changed by the interaction. So what is there to say? So again, if the momentum moves the electron perfectly straight, then you don't have any uncertainty. But if the electron was in tension and it moves in a direction, you have all kinds of uncertainty about which direction it moved because you don't have any tool to measure direction. You just have a tool to measure momentum. We so, so the less momentum that's transferred, the more likely it is it went in a direction and so there's your uncertainty, because you know it went in a direction and you have no clue what direction it went in, whether it went this way, this way, this way, this way, whatever sideways way there is to go, you have no way of knowing that. So the more you know it's bent, the more you know there's more angles it could be bent at. Right? Right. Now today that Heisenberg's argument for microscopes is not quite correct, but so she can see that it's not quite correct, uh, but we don't care. Uh, it's close enough. Remarkably enough, the conclusion is correct. Right. Well, it says them. So this is probably has to do more about this energy equation. So again, how they understand what energy is. So it probably doesn't come out exactly right in terms of their momentum numbers of recognizing when a photon's hitting something, what exactly is being exchanged. And part of the reason why it's probably not correct is because they never account for the ray length of what they call a photon. So you could have a photon that has four elements. You can have a photon that has 10 elements that hit something. You could have a photon that has 25 elements that hit something. So this is where it breaks down. There's no standard amount of energy in a ray length. So until you account for ray lengths of photons, you haven't accounted for anything. <laughs> I mean, that's the real story is this doesn't have a standard size. That's why a frog can see a photon that we don't see. So from our perspective, there's zero energy in the photon because there's no photon. Well, clearly there has to be energy there because the frog sees it. So we can already say there's no point in calling both of these things, the thing the frog saw and the thing we didn't see, and say, well, this is a photon and that's not a photon, the one that we didn't see. It's still energy hitting our retina. It's still a fact in the universe. 
So I'm just saying that's how far off their formulization is. It doesn't in any way account for the quanta, how many quanta are in the thing they call the photon. See, I mean, if you hit, if eight of them hit you, from their perspective, it's the same as six hitting you. There's, they don't make any distinction between those two photons. So you can understand that, that you know, this is a critical thing. I mean, you know, 17 humps on a camel is a lot different than three humps on a camel, right? I mean, we can tell the difference. That's more humps. So I'm just saying their, their formalization doesn't even, it doesn't in any way account for the variability of the ray length. And so that's why they're that's why they can't say this is explicitly correct and complete mathematics because yeah they're missing a big element which is how long was the ray of light indeed this uncertainty has nothing to do with microscopes in particular heisenberg's uncertainty is far more than that it's the general property of nature and it does not so own. says them, right? So this is the part they have absolutely no evidence. This is some general property of nature that uh, things are random, that they don't have uh, fixed positions, and that they don't have fixed interactions that uh, obeys explicit rules. I'm saying, of course, though that can be a perfectly reasonable ac explanation. It's perfectly consistent with the the reality we see, and there's no reason to pretend that we need an invisible man. We don't need one here. The old theory that everything has a fixed position and that everything has a fixed velocity and everything has a fixed direction is clearly works as an explanation, as a model. We don't need to believe this stuff. We hold for position and momenta, but for many other pairs of quantities. Many years later, Heisenberg wrote about his insight. So one might even assume that in the work on the gamma ray microscope and the uncertainty will... As I understand it, uh, Schrodinger and Einstein really hated Heisenberg. <laughs> so, you yeah. know. All right, so one might assume that in the work of gamma ray microscope and the uncertainty relation I used in knowledge, which I have acquired by this poor ex examination. Well, anyway, so obviously, see, you would use gamma rays um, because they have smaller polarization, not because they have a higher frequency they have a smaller polarization. I used the knowledge which I had acquired by this poor examination. I like this story because it tells us that if there is something that you don't understand, then don't be ashamed and run away from it, but dig into it. Maybe you... Right, so um, this whole idea that you don't understand is the tricky part. Yes, we should always be fully informed on everything in the universe. But obviously, we have to be selective. Um, there's only so many little things you can waste your neurons on. You can only store so much information reliably and dependably. So this all really doesn't mean anything. Uh, and again, I would argue that Heisenberg's end conclusion, so he did this studying and he didn't get the right answer. First, he didn't understand that polarization decides the size of the photon. And the other thing that decides the momentum of the photon, that is its final momentum, is going to be the ray length. So neither one of those are included in his analysis, and they're two things that are fundamental to the function. And also just the, the reasonable understanding that electrons are in fixed positions in the atom. They have a, they're tied to the proton, they're attracted to it, they're repelled by the other electrons. They're in a, in a tension, and the tension isn't consistent with the plane of the surface. No surface is perfectly flat, so to speak. The electrons and the atoms are doing all kinds of surface irregularity. So, of course, when you hit a particular electron, that electron has no obligation to be in perfect alignment with the direction of the photon and therefore move perfectly straight. You're hitting it at an obscure angle, so to speak, like hitting a, a, a pool balls. You hit the ball in the middle, it moves straight. You hit the ball on the side, it moves crooked. The same rules apply for electrons. So you know the transfer of the energy between the quanta of the photon and the electron has no reliable direction. It's completely dependent on the tension of the electron. You will find that no one really understands it, and you will leave your mark in science. 
thanks for watching see you next week yeah so this is a, see these are their look i'm going to clarify something i'm going to make you better understand give you more and it's really again more just misinformation in a sense that all of these stated facts heisenberg fa almost failed his exam heisenberg studied hard or uh, Heisenberg discovered some real truth of the universe. <clears throat> these are all just statements that aren't facts in the sense that they're these interpretations or a way of stating it is uh, implying that there's some other test or there's some reliability or some reason to believe. There is no reason to believe that anything else but our blindness is the cause of any uncertainty. We can't see it. That's why we're uncertainty. We, there's uncertainty about the results. Not that the things themselves are behaving uncertainly. They are obeying the rock solid hard rules of the universe and they are not doing any of this. I'm randomized. I'm rolling dice. I'm, you know, all the things Einstein insulted. This is a critical leap away from the plane of facts. They're asserting uh, uh, an explanation for which there's no need. It's like me saying, um, I hate to use a cold example because, yeah, the, the whole hysteria, but it's like me saying because you hiccuped, you have demons in your head. I mean, why would I do that? I mean, you know, why wouldn't I just say, oh, it's a physical phenomenon, you know, some trigger, neurology, blah, blah, blah. Why do I have to invent demons? There's no reason to invent demons to explain a hiccup. And there's no reason to explain, to, to invent a, a, a imaginary floating morph, amorphous, uh, can't tell where they are particles to explain the variability in the interaction. The fact that the cue balls don't always hit straight on. That's not hard to imagine, right? If you were blind and somebody told you to roll cue balls at other balls, you know, and you were blind, you know you're not going to hit them straight on every time. <laughs> There's every reason to believe you're going to scatter them. Why would you think anything else? I don't need to make it variable. The variability already exists in the hard mechanics as an assumption. You can, you can practically understand that there's no way of figuring out where the photon hit the elect, how it hit it, and there's no way to figure out how much tension the electron was in or what tension it was in. So we already have a ton of variables to explain why there's a variable result. All right, so enough of that and such. All right, so till the next time, I guess. I'll leave it at that to keep it simple, stupid, and all that. Comments aren't really all that interesting, so maybe I'll do one eventually. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, I suppose that's a good sign. Nobody can make a rational or counter argument to anything. Okay, so till the next time and such. So forth and whatnot.